Work's canceled. School's canceled. Is it Sunday? I don't know what day it is. Church? Canceled. But at least that's true to a non-zero extent, you know, for a lot of us, most of us. Um, but spring is not canceled. Um, we've got the rain outside to prove it. Um, but the sun comes out intermittently, and we've been cooped up too long. Uh, it may be a while longer, but one of the few liberating things we can do is go outside, take a walk. Um, and I have a way to do that that might elevate it a little bit, give you a little bit more value. And I even encourage you to bring your phone. All I'm looking to do today is briefly introduce you to iNaturalist desktop interface, explain how uh, easy it is to sort of unlock a biological community around you. Spring's the best time to do this. Um, you're bored, right? Go outside, give it a shot, um, learn a little bit more about, about what's going on, the plants and animals around you, get some fresh air, um, you know, get a little bit more value out of what otherwise might be sort of a mundane task. All right, let's have a look. Okay, so are you ready? I suggest this is really all you need to proceed, right? To get started where I'm going to with this video. So you have to find one or more plants or animals or fungi, just some sort of life form that piques your interest, that maybe you'd like to know a little bit more about. Maybe the next time you go out on that walk, you can point to it and say, hey, I know what that is, right? And frankly, you don't necessarily even have to go outside, right? If you've got bugs that are trying to, to get into your house, um, you know, and you're really curious about what it is that's invading, take a picture of it, take a few, right? You might be able to know a little bit more about what you're dealing with. At any rate, you need to photograph the organism uh, and make your best guess at what the diagnostic features are, right? What's going to separate this plant or this animal from any other? Uh, and so look for its markings. If you're looking at a plant, I'll show you an example in a moment. You're looking for the, the shape of the plant, the size of the plant, uh, what sort of flowers it might produce or other other products, right? So things like acorns can be identifying uh, if you're looking at an oak tree. The leaf structure and leaf shape, uh, colors, all that sort of stuff that would that would distinguish it from other species, right? You're going to want to capture that. Bonus points to you, right? If you can figure out how to get your GPS enabled, uh, and so I'm talking about on your phone, on your camera, so that when you take a picture, it's automatically tagged, right? Maps are going to have a lot to do with this. Bonus points. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if you can find a way to easily upload these pictures to your computer so that, as we're going to do today, you can take the pictures from your computer and put them on the iNaturalist relatively smoothly. Quickly, here's an example of what might be a good set of pictures for a given species. Right, so we have a Siniso, uh, it's sort of a brushy species, and so you get a sense looking at uh, the overall picture, kind of what its shape and size would be, but also getting close, and you'll see that my hands end up in a lot of pictures. Um, you know, in this example, you're better able to see and get in focus the details of the flower or the details of the leaves by getting up close to it and using your, your hand or some other kind of flat object behind it uh, you have something bigger for your phone to focus on. It ends up helping quite a bit. You don't want to find out later that your um, that your pictures are all blurry uh, unless you're able to just and, and interested in going back and finding those. Those are kind of lost, at least for the day. Okay, but we'll talk more about what makes a good picture in the remainder of the video, right? So that's going to be a theme. Other themes you're going to be uh, looking at and, and at least seeing one man's example of how to do this would be how to get your pictures from the field and onto iNaturalist. And so I'll kind of, I'll talk about what um, makes that a relatively user-friendly and fun experience or what otherwise might make it a little bit miserable for you, right? We're trying to, to make this a better experience going out and walking and, and connecting with nature, not make it a chore. And along the way, we're going to take a quick glance at the iNaturalist homepage. It is a social media interface where you can see what sort of features are there and the way that you might um, at least get a hint of how you might get more value out of it. And of course, in the future, we can look a little bit more closely at those different features that we're just going to get a glimpse at today. Okay, so are you ready?
Okay, note that I have a couple windows open already, um, and I'm kind of strictly focusing on the ones that are going to be the most useful and direct for getting our observations on the iNaturalist. And so I've got my downloads folder open, um, nothing in there yet, but there will be momentarily. Uh, to that point, I've got Google Photos open. It's just one of a number of options for, for getting the, the photos I've taken to put on the iNaturalist onto my computer, so therefore I can upload them. Uh, and then of course I need iNaturalist open as well. And so uh, I guess first thing I would say about photos, um, I'll kind of talk through this and maybe interject some examples. So uh, when you're taking pictures, you know, obviously depending on what you're trying to, to get, it might be relatively easy or it could be somewhat elusive. Uh, so taking pictures of plants ends up being a different process than taking pictures of birds, for instance. Uh, and so you just get what you can get, especially with the animals. Um, ideally, you'll get on any picture some uh, reference for size, um, you know, a relatively clear picture. Hopefully, the, the sun is shining on the, the animal or, or plant, um, but, you know, bottom line is you get what you can get. Uh, with plants, as long as you have, you know, reasonable access to them, it can be a, a pretty, um, you know, good practice to get multiple pictures. Right, get one, if the plant is in bloom, that's going to make it easier to identify anyway. But get a picture that is close up and focused on the flowers. Get a picture that is instead focused on uh, the, the leaves. You get some sort of size reference if you can. Uh, especially with smaller flowers, it tends to be that like a, an iPhone won't, um, won't always focus in where you want it to. You put your hand behind, uh, directly behind the, the flowers and you'll end up seeing them a lot better. Because you focus on your hand, well, you end up focusing on the flowers as well. Uh, and you'll realize that even just generally identifying plants, a lot of times it's the, the shape and size of, or the, the shape and arrangement of petals that's going to help you uh, kind of get on the right track. Uh, the other thing would be with your photos, uh, realize that sometimes uh, you have technology that's going to georeference your pictures. That's going to be important for iNaturalist. You'll see it's, it's very uh, map-based and very visual. Uh, and so if you have that capability, make sure it's turned on. Um, for me, my iPhone takes, uh, takes relatively clear pictures at close range uh, and has a very precise GPS. I have a, a digital camera that takes better pictures, especially at slightly longer range, but its GPS is sort of clunky. So you might have some trade-offs there. Uh, but certainly get what you can out of the location services or out of the GPS that you have uh, on your camera. So there are lots of ways to get your photos onto the computer. It depends on what, where they're coming from. Um, you know, I've emailed pictures to myself before from my phone uh, and from my camera. I've, you know, downloaded them from camera onto the phone, from the camera on the computer, using a cord, using wireless, using an SD card. Um, what I've found for me, for whatever reason, because there, there can be some extra steps in here, uh, I use Google Photos. So here's Google Photos. Uh, because on my phone, I have it automatically set up to upload my pictures as I go. And so, uh, you know, for instance, last Saturday, we took a walk in a neighborhood on the north side of San Antonio. And just kind of walking along the, the road, along the sidewalk, I uh, found a number of, of different plants. And then you can see here a uh, butterfly as well that will upload and so all these pictures were taken on my phone therefore they have relatively um, reliable GPS um, but we can look at you know what you might do if you didn't have that and so I'm going to be using the the computer app um, you know interface with iNaturalist realize you can use your phone as well uh, I haven't had nearly the same success with that especially if I don't have location turned on uh, that can be a very tedious process, and so, um, you know, hopefully this would be uh, a viable option for you to use the computer rather than the phone, uh, unless you really get the hang of it. So, from Saturday, I've got a number of pictures. Um, now, I can go through and just click each one I want. You know, maybe I want to skip some. I already know, you know, for instance, here's a blurry picture that I don't necessarily want in there, but I'll get that out later because otherwise I can scroll to the last picture I want, hold down shift, and it's going to select everything in between. All right, so here are all my pictures from Saturday the 28th that are going to go on to iNaturalist. I'm going to download these, which is why I have my downloads folder open. 
So realize, of course, that being on Google Photos, it's on a cloud, it's on the web. Uh, now I'm downloading it onto my computer. And so it's going to download into my uh, folder as a zip folder. So all of these are compressed. Uh, what I need to do then is extract them all so that they're full-size pictures so that I can upload them back onto iNaturalist. So taking it off the web, putting it on my computer, and I'm going to turn around and put it right back on the web. That's why I say maybe there's some inefficiency there. Uh, but anyway, extracting. So I just went with the default there. Of course, if you want to be more organized, you can. But now I have the compressed folder from where I downloaded it off of Google Photos. I have the folder where I actually have the pictures. And you see it had popped up here uh, on its own as well. Okay, so I've got pictures on my computer. These are the ones I'm going to want to upload. And you can kind of see, like I said, this is a, a walk along roadsides. Uh, and the, when you see it all on the map, it's going to kind of validate that point. Um, but, you know, in, in Texas especially, uh, there's a lot of wildflowers that start blooming in, in March and April. Um, and, you know, through some combination, partly thoughtful, partly laziness, uh, they're allowed to kind of bloom on the roadsides. Um, I would say it's overall a, more of a benefit than, um, than any harm done with that. So looking at iNaturalist now, and I'm just kind of keeping these in the split screen for the moment because it's a little bit easy, easier to see. Uh, but I'll go ahead and blow this up for, the, for just a minute to kind of, you know, let you see a little bit more clearly what iNaturalist interface looks like. All right, so um, you're going to need to create an account for iNaturalist. It is a social media uh, service, basically, uh, just with a very specific mission um, and sort of clientele. So uh, for me, logging in ends up being relatively simple, but you can create a username and password use your email to do that. I end up using Facebook and, you know, I've kind of accepted them as my overlords. Shout out Facebook. Uh, because even though there's a lot of, it's complicated, um, it's relatively easy as you'll see one click and I'm in. Okay, so I mentioned this is a social media type of interface. Uh, and so I've got a little bit of a feed here. Um, and so it's showing me based on the people that I follow, uh, what sort of observations they're adding. A lot of times they'll tell me what they're identifying. So there's an observation side where you go find things, put it on iNaturalist. But there's also going to be the identification side where if we're actually going to get real data out of this that researchers can use, you're going to need somebody to come along and, and either identify what you found, debate it possibly, uh, or if you know what it is, you still need to get a second opinion as you'll see. So these little research grade RG tags uh, are saying that somebody has come along and, and seconded that, or maybe third or fourth that, you know, there, there are lots of um, times where you'll get a bunch of people identifying the same thing, just kind of reinforcing it. Uh, but for instance, uh, GC Warbler's account, he posted Crete weed earlier, and evidently he's the only person that's identified it so far. So he needs somebody to come along and, and kind of validate that for him. I'll have a lot of those. And so sort of Looking along, you can kind of work your way back if you don't check in very frequently and kind of see what people have been doing. Um, you know, it's March 2020 now, almost April. Uh, but looking back here, there's a, a thing from July, July 8th, I posted white tridents. And I was the only person to have identified it. It was my observation. Uh, so now many months later, someone's come along uh, and actually seconded that. Okay, yeah, that's white tridents. So two relatively informed opinions. Say it's white tridents, and then it becomes research grade. So as of 14 hours ago, it wasn't, uh, and it sat that way for, for months. So it is kind of cool to come back and see something that I found last summer, uh, finally get that bump. Uh, but for me, there's all, you know, and there's all sorts of reasons why you might use this app. Uh, for me, it's just kind of helping me get acquainted. I'm not from Texas, uh, and there's just a lot more here than what I would have imagined. And so uh, I end up learning a lot, and obviously, there's sort of a collector tendency for me. Uh, it's, it's easy to kind of uh, curate your own collection of observations. It's a social media site, right? So there's a profile. You can do your little about me, the people you follow, the people that follow you, uh, a lot of your favorites, things like that. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a user-friendly and friendly interface. I'll emphasize that. Uh, remember, there's the observation side of things, right? So these are the, the uh, plants and animals I've uploaded uh, up through the 27th, which was the Friday before uh, what we're going to upload now. 
and you see a lot of them still need IDs. Uh, some of them that I've identified, some of them that other folks have. Uh, so for instance, Dakota Mock for Vane, relatively sure that's what I was seeing, but I'm the only person that's identified it so far. So it's not considered research grade. And really all research grade means that somebody who is doing research uh, would be able to, um, you know, with a reasonable amount of confidence, pull that data point and use it as part of a data set for, um, for either showing the distribution of a species um, or, you know, discussing, you know, maybe there's some sort of other variable that they're looking at uh, that's a hint at their genetics or their phenotype. There are lots of different ways you could possibly take it. Uh, and it's a relatively free and easy way to get uh, data, which is not necessarily true, uh, especially if you're trying to study a species across its whole range. Um, there's a lot of power there potentially, even though there are certainly some, some shortcomings, I guess, in this sort of data set uh, that I won't get into just now. All right, so uh, for me, I mean, I've only got a couple of favorites, but you can favorite, you know, cool pictures or interesting uh, discussions that you see. Um, the identification side of things, I'm pretty weak on this because I'm not a very confident identifier, uh, but lots of people are very expert in certain things. I know there's the same person that'll come through and every time I see a harvest man, a daddy long legs, they'll come along and identify it, you know, every few months. Um, that's pretty cool. You know, I've only done a, a, almost, you see, 181 identifications, um, but there are people who have done thousands, even hundreds of thousands of identifications. Some people are generous, some people have very specific interests, um, but remember that you have to get IDs ultimately for it to be useful in a scientific sense. There are projects too, uh, and so um, you know, I've got some from Texas where I live and work now, some from Indiana where I'm from, and then also uh, here's an example, Whitefish Point, uh, that's a, a beach management unit of the National Wildlife Refuge in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan that I worked at a couple summers ago. And so the projects are kind of cool because they can set some sort of time parameters. They can certainly set uh, geographic parameters. So this is specific to this point that juts out into Lake Superior and Whitefish Bay. I mentioned in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right? Uh, and so, you know, I'm pretty far away from there now in South Central Texas, uh, but it's kind of cool to look back at what I observed over that time and what others have come along and added since then. So this is a relatively small project. Others uh, are enormous. So like the Texas Pollinator BioBlitz was just for a couple weeks um, this last fall. And it was everybody in Texas that took, an, took a picture of a plant, took a picture of a pollinator. Uh, and so they ended up with over 35,000 observations in two weeks. That's a cool data set that is you know, relatively confined. Um, and that you can go back and do the same thing next year and compare it to. Anyway, enough about that. We'll get into the mechanics of actually uploading some uh, observations here. So you've got an upload button up here that I'll use. I'm going to go back and split the screen for a moment so I can see my, my pictures. I can see iNaturalist. I'm just going to click and drag these over. So it's relatively user-friendly, whereas I mentioned, relatively, the phone app is not, in my experience. All right, so looks like I sent 29 pictures over. There are not 29 different species here, right? So I mentioned that you might want to try to get a couple different pictures of the same plant, for instance. I have a tendency to take two or three of each, um, and I'm looking again for a good picture of the bloom, a good picture of the leaves, some sort of size reference. Um, I don't always get all, all those boxes checked, but um, you know, especially for something I don't know it off the top of my head, I'm going to assume it's not very easy to identify, and so the more I can give, as far as context goes, the more likely it is to actually get identified. Okay, so these are all in, and you can see uh, that each one is going to need some sort of identification down to species ideally, uh, but the beauty of taking these pictures off my phone, the way that I've set it up is I've got uh, an exact date, exact time, uh, and a relatively exact location, um, and so again, that's going to be, you know, dependent on what your, uh, what the strength of your um, GPS is. Okay, let's pause, take a breath. That feels like a good place to kind of stop for the moment. We'll come right back to this page, but having gotten the photos up on iNaturalist, um, they aren't posted yet, but we have a little bit more work to do uh, to make sure that when we post them, they're effective at um, getting you information about what you're seeing, potentially 
uh, making these observations research grades so they have some sort of scientific value as well. Okay, so we're going to talk about next time, uh, starting from that page, how to effectively batch photos, especially uh, you know if you can if you have a good sense of what your your best photo is, putting that photo forward. So maybe it only takes one glance for a trained eye to to help you identify it. Otherwise, how to to layer in those other pictures of support. Um, assigning or correcting locations. We'll have an example where the GPS was just a little bit off for one observation. I'll show you how to fix it uh, and preach a little bit about why you want to ideally have those those photos located already uh, before you um, get onto iNaturalist. So that, that would be trying to get your GPS to link up with your camera. And then finally trying to identify your observations, giving at least some sort of preliminary guess if you don't know. Um, and that's going to be sort of a, a struggle, right? This can be a symbiosis or it can be sort of a weird competition type of uh, situation between man and machine, between your best guess and your knowledge versus the best guess that uh, the iNaturalist robot, basically the, the plant and animal recognition feature is going to, to put out there for you. And so we'll talk about how to make uh, at least an informed decision um, about what sort of identification you're going to give to your observation. So that's it for now. Um, obviously we have a little bit of direction going forward. Uh, if you got this far, maybe uh, you have enough interest to, to like it, to share, subscribe to the, the channel, add a comment. Um, you know, maybe if you got this far, you've got some rage to get out because uh, it fell way short of your expectations. That's fine. It's something you might can even enjoy with friends and family someday. Uh, once your social distancing guidelines are loosened up, uh, or if you get really into it, it will promote social distancing well into the future. Uh, you can do any of this stuff or not, um, but if there's a way to make it more useful in the future, uh, if I agree, I'll certainly do my best. All right, we'll talk to you next time.